Good morning, everybody. So good to have you here today on every Parker Hill campus. And a big shout out to those of you watching online as well. And no matter where you happen to be today as you hear this message, it is my hope and my prayer that you will not just hear the voice of a man, but that you will hear the voice of God speaking to you in a very personal, very practical, and very powerful way. This is week number four in this series on the life of David, and as some of you may know, the Bible describes David as a man after God's own heart. And so we believe that there are some very valuable lessons that we can learn from the life of David that will help us to also be people after God's own heart. And today, as we continue this series, I want to talk today about the difference between expectation and reality. Because sometimes the difference between expectation and reality can be significant. Let me tell you what I'm talking about just by showing you a few pictures. Uh, Like in the middle of winter, you want to go inside for a cup of hot chocolate. You know, on the left, that's your expectation of what your wife is going to make for you. And on the right, that's sometimes the reality. Or how about this one? If you've ever fallen asleep in public, you know, that may be your expectation of what you looked like while you were sleeping, but then you see the shot on somebody else's camera phone, uh, phone camera, camera phone, yeah, and it's looking more like this. I, I had that happen to me recently. Or today you go to lunch and you go to, to get something to eat at the restaurant, and the expectation because of the picture on the menu, it's this on the left-hand side, but that's what ends up on your plate. Or one more, because we're celebrating the end of winter here, you know, when you go out to make a snowman with your kids, you know, this is kind of what they're expecting, and this is what you produce for them as their parent. Uh, Sometimes there's a big difference between expectation and reality, and the truth is, sometimes in life, we struggle with the gap between expectation and reality. And so the question I want you to grapple with today is this question, what do you do when life isn't turning out the way that you expected? What do you do when your plans aren't coming together and when your dreams aren't coming true? What do you do when there's this big gap between what you expected your life to look like and what it really does look like? And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Maybe for you, it's your career, and you haven't reached the height in your career that you thought you would have reached at this point in your life. Maybe for some of you, it's the fact that you're single because you had expected that at this point in your life, you'd be married, but you're still waiting, still single. Or maybe some of you are married, but your marriage, the reality of your marriage looks nothing at all like what you expected Or for some of you, maybe you had a certain expectation about where you would be at this point in your life financially, but you're not even close to that. I mean, what do you do when life isn't turning out the way you expected, when the path you're on isn't taking you where you wanted it to go or isn't getting you there fast enough? What do you do in those situations? Well, today I want to talk about a temptation that I think all of us face in those situations when life isn't turning out the way you thought it would. And the temptation is to do this, to take a shortcut, to compromise, to maybe move outside the boundaries that God has set for you, to kind of take matters in your own hands and manipulate people or do things that you know you probably shouldn't do because you think it's the only way that you're ever going to get to the reality that you had expected in your life. So today I want to give you a word of caution. Uh, Some messages are a word of hope. Today is a word of caution And it's this, that a moral shortcut will lead you to a spiritual dead end. And this is the lesson that we learned today from the life of David, that a moral shortcut will always lead you to a spiritual dead end. And the time when we are most tempted to take that shortcut is when there's this big gap between expectation and reality. And today, as we continue this series in the life of David, we're going to look at a time in his life when he came to a place where reality wasn't even close to his expectation. And in that time, he had the perfect opportunity to take a shortcut, a moral and ethical shortcut. But instead, David chose to trust God, listen to him, and be patient. 
So today, we're going to be in 1 Samuel uh, 24. So if you have a Bible, you can go ahead and turn there, or you can bring up 1 Samuel 24 on your mobile device and have it in front of you. And while you're doing that, let me just go back and recap a little bit, because the only way you're ever going to understand what we talk about today is to understand the backstory, what's happened so far. So let me rewind to the beginning of this series. Three weeks ago, Uh, We started this series talking about the the account of David being anointed uh, as the future king of Israel. 1 Samuel 13 is where we began, where it says this. So Samuel, who was the spiritual leader in Israel at the time, he was the prophet. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him, David, in the presence of his brothers. And anointing someone with oil was a symbol of God's blessing and favor and God's choosing. And it says, from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. And so David was a teenager at this time, and he was anointed as the future king of Israel. Now, he didn't become king immediately because there already was a king. His name was Saul. We'll get to him in a minute. But David would be the one who would succeed Saul as the next king. Now, a few years after this took place, David came to what would be the most pivotal moment in his life when David one day defended the honor of God and defended the freedom of his people when David went toe-to-toe with a giant by the name of Goliath and he killed him. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17, let's jump there. It says, reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine. And by the way, Goliath was a part of this people group, the Philistines, and the Philistines were to the people of Israel kind of what the Klingons were to the Federation, so I hope that helps you understand. He struck him on the forehead, and the stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground, and so David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Great story. Dan White taught on that a couple of weeks ago. It was awesome. But as you might imagine, that day David became a national hero to the people of Israel. In fact, if you skip ahead to chapter 18, here's what happens when they come back. When the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing. So far, so good, but here's what they said. As they danced, they sang, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his tens of thousands. Now, there's a little bit of poetic license here because David had not literally killed 10,000 enemy soldiers. He killed one. It was a really big one, but it was just one. But this is their way of celebrating David's incredible accomplishment. But Saul heard this, and he was not a happy camper. Look at verse 8. Saul was very angry, for this refrain galled him. They have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with only thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom? And at this moment, there was a significant change in the relationship between King Saul and David. It says, from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. And so Saul began to see David as a threat to his power. And he began to have this spirit of jealousy that began to grow up in his heart and take root. And eventually, here's what happens. Eventually, King Saul decides that he doesn't want David around anymore where people can make the comparisons between the two of them. And so he decides to put David in charge uh, of a group of soldiers in the army, and he sends them off to war, secretly hoping that David would get killed in battle. Skip ahead to verse 13 of 1 Samuel 18. It says this, So he sent David away from him and gave him command over a thousand men, and David led the troops in their campaigns. In everything he did, he had great success because the Lord was with him. So this kind of backfired on Saul. When Saul saw how successful he was, he was afraid of him, but all Israel loved David because he had led them in their campaigns or their battles. And so here's what's happening. David is becoming more and more popular and more and more successful. And Saul just gets more and more insecure and more and more jealous. He becomes insanely jealous. Let me just give you an example of how the jealousy and the insecurity began to control his heart. Later in this same chapter in in 1 Samuel 18, it describes how David fell in love with Saul's daughter, and they wanted to be married. And you would think that Saul, because of his jealousy of David, would say, no, you can't marry my daughter. But surprisingly, he says, yes. But here's his motive behind it. Look at verse 20. Saul's daughter, Michal, was in love with David. David. 
And when they told Saul about it, he was pleased. I will give her to him, he thought, so that she may be a snare to him and so that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. You know what he's saying? Simply this. When David became the son-in-law of the king, he would have a much bigger target on his back. And there would be an even greater chance that he would get killed by the enemies, the Philistines. So essentially, Saul in his jealousy and his insecurity says, David, David, welcome to the family, son. I hope you get killed. This is how deeply his jealousy had infected his heart. So eventually what happens is is Saul's insecurity gets so intense and his jealousy becomes so intense that he no longer tries to hide it. He personally and openly begins to try to get rid of David. Chapter 19, we looked at this last week. It says this, Saul tried to pin him to the wall with his spear, but David eluded him as Saul drove the spear into the wall. And that night, David made his escape. And so David had no other option but to become a fugitive. He left behind his family. He left behind his country. He left behind his wife. And he spent the next several years of his life running from a king who desperately wanted to kill him. Can I suggest to you that David's life was not going as he had planned? Isn't it obvious to you that his reality wasn't even close to his expectations? I mean, he was supposed to be the next king. He had loved God and honored God. He had fought courageously for his nation. But now he's being chased and he's being hunted like a common animal. And he's being hunted by his own father-in-law. I mean, you talk about a huge gap between expectations and reality, what do you do when that happens? What do you do in that moment? Well, let's pick up the story now in 1 Samuel chapter 24. I hope you found it by now on your mobile device or on your, in your Bible there. This is where the story gets really interesting, and I think this may be the favorite part of David's story for every middle school boy, and you'll see what I mean in a minute. Verse 1, after Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told, David is in the desert of En Gedi. So Saul took 3,000 chosen men from all Israel and set out to look for David and his men near the crags of the wild goats. And so Saul gets a tip about where David is hiding. And so Saul rounds up 3,000 of his best soldiers and they go looking for David. Now it says here that David was hiding in the desert of En Gedi. And you can still see the desert of En Gedi today if you go to Israel and take a tour. Uh, this is what it looks like. And if you wanted to run from somebody and hide from somebody, this was like the ideal place to do it. Because there were these limestone cliffs and hills that were just dotted with natural caves. There were hundreds of them. And so this is where David is hiding. Now here's where the story gets really, really interesting. Verse 3. He came, this is Saul, he came to the sheep pens along the way. A cave was there, and Saul went in to relieve himself. David and his men were far back in the cave. (laughs) Now be honest, how many of you even knew like this was in the Bible, right? Uh, Some people say, oh, the Bible is so unrealistic. Uh, Come on, that is real right there. So here's what I imagine would have happened. Uh, David sees Saul and his 3,000 men coming from a distance. And so David decides, listen, guys, and David's got a few hundred guys. He says, listen, we can't outrun them. We'll never outfight them. Let's hide in these caves until they go by, and then we'll go the opposite direction. But then, all of a sudden, the king, King Saul, he's got to make a pit stop. And he's the king, and so the king stops the entire army, and he gets off his horse, and he says, why don't you guys hang out here? I just, you know, need some time alone with me and God. And so he wanders off into a cave, and he goes inside the cave, and he took off his robe, most likely, laid that aside, took off his sword, goes a little farther back in the cave, grabs a magazine, and takes care of business. Lo and behold, David And his guys are hiding way back in this very same cave, and they're watching all of this happen. Now, my friends, this is the textbook definition of a golden opportunity. I mean, here was the guy who had made David's life miserable. I mean, all he has to do is kill Saul, and he eliminates his problem, and he gets to take the throne for himself. I mean, in this moment, all that David needs to do to become number one is to take out a guy who's doing number two. Sorry, 
No more bathroom humor, I promise. But think about it. Put yourself in David's place, honestly. What would you do in that moment? And if you know the story, if you've heard the story, forget that you've ever read it. What would you do in this moment? And I got to tell you, it would have been very, very tempting for David to take a shortcut and to just end the whole thing right then and there. In fact, in the cave that day, there were four voices that David was hearing as he had to make this decision. Here was the first voice. It was the voice of his emotions. I mean, there were a lot of emotions in that cave that day. I mean, David's in there, and in walks Saul. He's mere feet or yards away from David. This was the man who was trying to kill him, who had ruined his reputation, who had caused him to become a a fugitive. And in David's heart, all of these emotions must have been swelling up, anger and fear and betrayal and hurt. And do you know what David's emotions were telling him? Kill him. Get rid of him. Take him out. That was the voice of his emotions. And, and, and David could have done what so many of us do. We make decisions based on what our emotions are telling us. You know, it feels like the right thing to do. How could it be wrong when it feels so right? But those weren't the only voices in the cave that day. There was also the voice of his circumstances. I mean, think about these circumstances. These circumstances are absolutely incredible. What are the odds that Saul would have to stop and go to the bathroom at just that moment? And what are the odds that he would walk into the one cave that David was hiding in? What are the odds that David would be right there with his enemy, with his enemy alone and unarmed? What are the odds of that? And from a human perspective, oh my goodness, this looked like a God thing. And David in that moment must have been so tempted to do well, what we often do, we assume that just because all the circumstances line up in a certain way, then yeah, that must be God's will, right? I mean, how many people make decisions based on, on circumstances? Like, yeah, you know, I really wanted that 90-inch flat screen TV for my two-bedroom apartment. And then, lo and behold, it went on sale at Best Buy. And Mark, you won't believe it, that very same day, I got my tax return check in the mail, which covered like 5% of the cost. And then in the same mailbox that day, I also got a credit card application. I mean, obviously, it was a God thing, so I bought it. And I'm in debt up to my eyeballs, and I can't tithe, but it must have been God's will because everything lined up so perfectly. This is the voice of circumstances. And let me tell you, when you get the voice of emotion and the voice of circumstances all running together, it is so easy to make an incredibly foolish decision and take a shortcut that you never should take. But then there was a third voice in the cave that day, and that was the voice of David's friends. Verse 4, the men said, this is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. In other words, David... This is your moment. David, can you believe what's happening right now? This is your time, David. Take him out. And so his circumstances, his emotions, even his friends are telling him, David, take the shortcut. And it would be so easy for him to do that. But let me ask you a question, very important question. Were those three voices the only voice that David needed to listen to that day? The voice of his emotions and his circumstances and his friends? Was there another voice that he needed to hear? Or let me ask the question a different way. How many of you know someone, and you can raise your hand when I ask this question on every campus, how many of you know someone who made a decision based on emotions and circumstances and the well-meaning advice of friends, and it turned out to be a really bad decision? How many of you know somebody who's done that? How many of you are the somebody that you know? Yeah, because it's so easy to do that. And David had to listen to a fourth voice in the cave that day, and that was this voice, the voice of his shepherd. Because the most famous piece of writing that David ever ever crafted was Psalm 23, where he said this, the Lord is my shepherd. And then hundreds of years later, Jesus comes along, and one day he said this. He said, I'm the good shepherd. My sheep hear my voice, and they know me, and they follow me. And in those crucial decisions, in that gap between expectations and reality, when everything within you, when every voice that you're hearing is telling you, 
to compromise and take matters into your own hands and take the shortcut. You listen to one voice, and that is the voice of your shepherd if you're a follower of Christ. This is what David does. Let me pick up the story, end of verse 4. Then David crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. I I think Saul had probably laid it aside, so David wasn't right near Saul. And we don't know why David creeps up and cuts off a corner of the robe. It doesn't say. Maybe he was just, you know, wanting to have a souvenir of that day. Maybe he just wanted to prove how close he could get to Saul. My guess is that some of his buddies back in the cave were saying, I dare you. I double dog dare you. So David creeps up, cuts off a corner of the robe, and, and then he goes back to where the guys are waiting in the back of the cave, and they, they're, they're waiting for Saul to finish up so they can do what they're about to do. But listen to this. It says, afterward, David was conscience stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. Like what? Like David, <laughs> This is the guy who's trying to kill you, David. And all you did was cut off a corner of his robe. But here's the thing. David was so dialed into the heart of God. David was so tuned in to the voice of the Lord. He was so tuned in to the voice of his shepherd that even this small act of aggression brought him to a point of conviction. So here's what he goes on to say, verse 6. He said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lift my hand against him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. And he goes on to say this to his men. With these words, David rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave and went his way. So Saul gets out alive. And in the moment of truth, in the gap between expectation and reality, in that moment when Many, many people would have just taken a shortcut. David turns to his men and he says, listen, guys, this is the king. And maybe you forgot this, but it's against God's law to kill the king. And yeah, he may not be acting appropriately and he may may have done wrong by me and by all of us, but it is not my place to kill the king because he is God's anointed and God put him in power. And if God wants to take him out of power, then that's God's prerogative, but he will do it in his time and in his way. Now, David wasn't excusing what Saul had done. In fact, we're going to see in a few minutes that David confronts Saul in a very strong and eloquent way. But here's what David understood. He understood that to take a moral shortcut would only lead him to a spiritual dead end. And so David chooses to listen in that cave that day to the one voice that really mattered, which is the voice of God. Let me go go back to the question that we started with. What do you do when life isn't turning out the way that you expected? What do you do when the path that you're on isn't taking you where you wanted to go or isn't getting you there fast enough? When the dream isn't coming true and the plan isn't coming together, what do you do in the gap between expectation and reality? You've got two choices. You really do. You can take a shortcut or you can just listen to God, do what He says, trust in Him, and keep following And you may think, well, Mark, what do you mean take a shortcut? Well, that could be a lot of different things, but let me tell you what I think are the three most common shortcuts that people take. Here's the first one. You see it in this story. Revenge, where you just decide to settle the score, to take matters into your own hands, to play God. Your husband treats you badly, so you cheat on him, or you walk out. Your boss has made your life difficult, and you're not moving up in the company like you would hope to. And so you just ruin his reputation and you undermine his authority. You get revenge. That's a shortcut. Instead of waiting, trusting, and acting appropriately. The second one is what I would call stolen pleasure. You know, when life hasn't turned out the way that you want it to, you just kind of escape into some kind of illicit pleasure and you justify it. And you say, well, my wife isn't meeting my needs and therefore I've got to find some other way to meet my needs. You take a shortcut. Or you cheat your company and you say, you know, you cheat them out of time or materials, and you say, well, the way that they treat me, they deserve it. Or you just escape into some form of self-medication like drugs or alcohol or shopping or food or whatever it is, and you say, you know, after all I've been through, I think God understands, you need to understand as well, stolen pleasure. Third shortcut is simply compromise, compromise. The young lady who says, you know, I'm tired of being single, 
So I'm just going to hook up with this guy that I probably shouldn't be around, and I would never marry, but I would just rather be with anybody than be with nobody. And so she compromises and takes a shortcut for the sake of an unfulfilled expectation. Or you say to yourself, you know, my income isn't what I thought it would be, so I'll just cheat the government or I'll just cheat God and I'll compromise. Those are shortcuts. Revenge, stolen pleasure, compromise. And there are many others. But what do you do when you come to that moment, the gap between reality and expectation? You've got two choices. You can take the shortcut or you can just listen to the voice of your Savior and you can trust Him and you can follow Him and you can stay on the path and you can say, God, it's in your hands and I'll let you bring about the fulfillment of my expectations in your way and in your time. So here's how the story ends. Let me read the rest of the passage. Saul left the cave and went his way. Then David went out of the cave and called out to Saul, My Lord, the king! When Saul looked behind him, David bowed down and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. He said to Saul, Why do you listen when men say David is bent on harming you? This day you have seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into my hands in the cave. Some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not lift my hand against my master because he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father? And he holds up the little corner of the robe. He says, look at this piece of your robe in my hand. I cut off the corner of your robe but did not kill you. And at that point, I think Saul's looking at his robe and he's like, dang it, whoa. Now understand and recognize that I'm not guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. I have not wronged you, but you are hunting me down to take my life. May the Lord judge between you and me, because I'm not going to be the judge, David says. And may the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me, but my hand will not touch you. Let's skip to verse 16. When David finished this, Saul asked, is that your voice? David, my son, and he wept aloud. You are more righteous than I, he said. You have treated me well, but I have treated you badly. And you have just now told me of the good you did to me. The Lord delivered me into your hands, but you did not kill me. When a man finds his enemy, does he let him get away unharmed? May the Lord reward you well for the way you treated me today. I know that you will surely be the king and that the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hands And then Saul takes his 3,000 men, and he turns around, and he goes home. Let me tell you how the rest of the story plays out. It wasn't long after this that Saul was in battle against the Philistines. And a fluke shot from an archer landed an arrow between Saul's pieces of armor, and he died on the battlefield. And after he died, David went back home to his country and he was crowned as the new king of Israel. And God blessed his leadership in a powerful way. And David brought his country to a place of stability and a place of prosperity and a place of spiritual health that they had never seen before in their history. And David is still known today as one of the greatest leaders in the history of the nation of Israel. But there's a question I ask myself whenever I read a story like this. And maybe it's just me, but I ask myself this question. What if, what if David had decided to take a shortcut in the cave that day? What if David had done what his emotions and his circumstances and his friends were telling him to do? How would his story be different? And it's a little bit of conjecture, but not a whole lot. Here's what would have happened, I believe. He still would have become king. In fact, he would have gotten to the throne a lot sooner but it would have been different. He would have had a stain on his reputation. And every once in a while, somebody would come up to him and they would say, so David, how is it that you happen to become the king of Israel? And David would have to say, well, I was hiding in a cave one day when the previous king, Saul, came in to use the bathroom. And I snuck up behind him. He was unarmed and it was dark. And uh, I just walked up behind him and I whacked his head off. And that's how I became the king. Wow, Dad, you're really brave. That must have taken a lot of courage to sneak up behind a guy, go in the bathroom, and whack his head off in a dark cave when he was all alone. This is the story that David would have told. This is the story that he would have written for himself if he had taken a shortcut. And you know what else? In doing that, David would have spent the rest of his life looking over his shoulder because by his leadership, he would have created a culture that 
where the way you get to be king is by killing the king before you. But instead, he created a culture of honor because he chose to stay on the right path. And I think if David had taken a shortcut, he would not have been able to lead his nation with confidence because he would have always been wondering in the back of his mind if he had come to that position of leadership at the right time in the right way and with God's blessing. In short, if David had killed Saul, I think he would have regretted that decision for the rest of his life. I'm going to have the band come on back up because we're going to close with one more song. And as they come, let me just say this. I don't know where all of this lands with you. It's a fascinating story. But I I don't know what decisions you're facing. I don't know what kind of cave you're hiding in uh, these days. But here's what I know about many of you here today, even though I don't know most of you personally. I know this, and I would bet that the major decisions of your life that you look back on with regret and the major decisions of your life that you look back on and that you would love to undo if you could were decisions that you made when you took a moral shortcut, when you just decided to listen to your circumstances and your emotions and even some well-meaning people. Because see, we all have two choices. We can either take a shortcut or we can trust God, listen to Him, follow Him, and trust Him for the future. And here's what I want for you so desperately. I want you to live a life of God's favor and blessing. I want you to be a man or woman after God's own heart. And that means this, that no matter where you're living between reality and expectation, that in those times when you just, when everything within you wants to take some kind of a moral shortcut, when you want to take matters into your own hands, when you want to compromise, my great prayer for you is that you will just trust and that you will put your future and your life in the hands of God and listen to Him and keep taking steps in His direction, knowing that eventually He will bring you to the place that you need to be. In closing, I just want to read some of David's words. And we're not going to put these words on the screen. I just want you to listen to them. In fact, in just a moment as I begin to read this, just close your eyes and imagine David out there in the wilderness being pursued, running for his life, hiding in caves, And imagine yourself, whatever you're running from, whatever's pursuing you, whatever cave you're living in this day, just hear these words of David so that you can continue to trust and listen and walk in the right direction. Just close your eyes and listen as I read from Psalm 27. David wrote this, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. Teach me your way, Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong, and take heart, and wait for the Lord.